What if your garage could produce a farm's worth of oyster mushrooms, custom bred for bigger yields and ironclad contamination resistance? Today, I'll pull back the curtain on the advanced breeding techniques used by large scale farms and show you how to replicate them at home. By the end, you'll know how to isolate, test, and scale your own high performance oyster strains. No PhD required. What's up mushroom fam? It's Gary with Fresh From The Farm Fungi. I'm here at my farm in Sedalia, Colorado and today I'm going to do a deep dive into breeding oyster mushrooms. But before we get into breeding, if you want to start your operation with premium oyster genetics, go check out our Etsy shop Fresh Fungi where we have over 30 different varieties of gourmet mushrooms and we ship globally. So the first question of breeding mushrooms is why would you breed your own strains in the first place? So there are many benefits to breeding your own strains, especially oyster mushrooms. By breeding strains in-house, you'll get better yields, faster growth, and improved disease resistance. You'll also be able to tailor your mushrooms towards your local climate and local resources that are available to make substrate. So it will also allow you to become more independent and long-term that would pay off big time because you won't be reliant on commercial spawn. So now that you know the reasons why you'd wanna breed your own mushroom strains, let's get started explaining oyster genetics. Oyster mushrooms, like most mushrooms, are going to exist in two forms, monocarion and dicarion. Monocarion are strains that have one nuclei and they have yet to fuse with a mated pair. So this occurs when a spore germinates, forms hyphae and forms mycelium and starts to colonize a substrate but has yet to be introduced to a compatible pair. So as soon as a monocarion meets another monocarion and they are compatible with each other, which means that they have genetics that are complementary. They will fuse and exchange genetic material and form a dicarion. So dicarions have two nuclei, have two sets of genetic information, and they will fully colonize a substrate and eventually form mushrooms where a monocarion, even if it colonizes a substrate, it doesn't have the capacity to produce mushrooms. So compatibility is extremely important because it will determine strain, vigor, and uniform fruiting. And if you don't have two compatible pairs, they will never fuse to form a dicarion. So mushrooms are unique to other organisms in that there's many compatible pairings that are possible. So it's not just a female and a male monocarion, but there's many, many different combinations that could happen. The first order of breeding is to isolate a bunch of different monocarions so that you can systematically mate them with each other to form different phenotypes or genotypes. So genotypes are the genetic expression or the genetic potential of that organism. So it's all the genes in a sequence that is located in the nucleus. A phenotype is the physical expression of the genotype. So that is dependent on the environment that it's growing in and other factors like the material that it's growing on, which will express the phenotype. Okay, so some of the essential equipment is going to be the pressure cooker, auger plates, scalpel or uh, inoculation loops, 
um, airflow solution. So either a flow hood, an FFU, or if you have to, you can work in a still air box. Some affordable alternatives are going to be uh, mason jars that you can use for pressure cooking. Uh, glove boxes as well. I don't recommend glove box because it could get really cumbersome, but it is an alternative if you have to use that. So step one, isolating your starting material. In order to breed new varieties, you're going to want to start from spore. You can also isolate tissue, but this would be a cloning of the current strain that you're doing. So there's pros and cons to both. And we did another video on starting with spores versus mycelium, if you wanna go check that out. Making a clean spore suspension. So one of the key starting points in breeding mushrooms is to get clean spores and also clean spores that can easily be separated. So I prefer to do a serial dilution when I'm breeding mushrooms from spore, but you can also do a three-part streak which is achieving the same end goal. First, start off with clean spores. So you can obtain those from a fruited mushroom or you can purchase spores online or get a spore print from a wild mushroom. Now, it's important to isolate single spores because in order to gather a lot of variance in the mushrooms that are being produced, you have to have a big variation of spores or monocaryons. By using a serial dilution, you can isolate one single spore in a single volume or vessel. I will usually start with a pretty heavy concentration of spores and then dilute those out about three or four dilutions to get one to 10 spores per milliliter. From there, I'll take those spores and inoculate them onto their own Petri dish. So I personally like to use the smaller dishes so that you can do a lot more in the same amount of space. By using a cereal dilution, I'll get a really diluted solution and inoculate one drop onto one Petri dish. In principle, this should mean that only a monocaryon will germinate and emerge on that plate. So there's a few techniques you can do to validate this. The first way is to just go on with your experiment and cross these strains. If they're resistant to each other, then the chances are you have a dicaryon. The second method is to look under the microscope. So as you are watching these spores germinate, you can use a stereoscope and actually observe a single spore germinating its hyphae. If you don't have a stereoscope, you can also use a compound microscope and validate that the mycelium is a monocaryon versus a dicaryon. So this is a little bit more complex, especially with oyster mushrooms, but you can either look for a clamp connection which is pretty subjective, but it does validate that that mycelium is a dicaryon, or you can use a stain and observe for single nuclei in that mycelium. So either way, you can either verify that it's a monocaryon or a dicaryon under the microscope. First, you're going to want to gather a collection of monocaryons you're going to want to validate that those are in fact monocaryons. And then once you have a substantial library, you will have to cross them individually on separate Petri dishes. So this can get very overwhelming if you're working with a lot of strains, but I recommend using a permutation or a systematical organization for doing so. So if you choose to do the alternative method and do a three-part streak, you will just have to gather those monocaryons from the mother plate and separate them out onto their own Petri dishes after they germinated. So this adds an extra step, but it also consolidates the 
germination process into one step. Either method that you choose to do will require precise record keeping. So I always label by uh, numerics of when those spores germinate and make sure that you date the plate as well. Otherwise you won't be able to tell how old that mycelium is. So now that you have a substantial library of monocaryons, you'll have to mate them on their own Petri dishes. So I like to just start with one monocaryon and cross it with all the remaining ones and repeat this process until every single monocaryon has been crossed with a different partner. It will take a few days to a couple weeks for this mycelium to grow out on the Petri dish and potentially cross. You should observe these dishes every day because there's going to be a huge variance in growth from one monocaryon to the other. Now, in order to observe a successful pairing, you're going to want to observe for either clamp connections uh, dicaryon cells or or from a macro perspective you could observe for what is called zones of inhibition. A zone of inhibition is only going to appear when the two cells are incompatible so they will grow up to each other and form a wall and eventually you'll just notice that there's two separate colonies on that plate and that is indicating that those two colonies were incompatible. So they could have either been accidentally dicaryons that have crossed path, or they were just incompatible monocaryons and they did not have complementary genetics. So you can instantly rule out those cultures before you move on to the next step, which is going to be phasing in or phasing out successful mated pairings. I like to work in smaller jars and smaller size bags for my uh, pheno hunts because the end goal is just to find a successful variant instead of actually increasing your production, which you can do later on. Testing on small substrate blocks, whether it's straw or sawdust, or if in the case of oysters, I would search the cheapest local substrate to selectively breed on. Once you have all your materials gathered and a plan in place for running your operation, it's going to be really critical to take good notes and to organize all of these different strains so you'll be able to select for the best one. So one thing that I select for is growth speed and vigor. So I will observe my grain spawn every day and then select maybe the top five or 10 that colonize that grain the fastest. In this phase, you can also test for stress factors like environmental factors or contamination resistance. So this is all something that you'll have to implement into your testing phase. However, once you achieve a really good quality of grain spawn, you can move on to your bulk substrate. Now this is where you can get creative. So I recommend once again, testing on a bunch of different substrates. That way it will make your farm very efficient and independent for the long term. So once you have your grain spawn and you inoculate it into your bulk substrate, you can go ahead and test in your fruiting chamber. This is one of the most exciting parts about breeding mushrooms because if you do it correctly, you can select for mushrooms that prefer your specific growing environment, which is much more efficient than trying to tailor your environment to a specific mushroom, which is what a lot of farms do early on because they haven't gone through this process. So once you select for the healthiest and the strongest, and the heaviest yielder, then it's a good time to scale your production. Once you have a good strain and you've scaled your production, it doesn't exactly stop here. 
So over the course of time, your strains might deteriorate slightly. This is called senescence. So another final factor that I like to breed for is the resistance to senescence over time. And this will only occur after batches and batches and batches are produced and you realize that the integrity of that mushroom persists. So most commercial strains on the market have been tested time after time for resistance to senescence. So don't give up if your strains start to degrade, just go back to the drawing board. So to wrap things up, breeding your own mushrooms are going to be incredibly more efficient. They're going to utilize local resources and they're going to tailor your mushroom farm towards your own environment, which will ultimately save costs in the end. I hope you guys enjoyed this thorough breakdown on how to breed oyster mushrooms. If you'd like to start off with premium quality oysters, go check out our mushroom shop, Fresh Fungi. And until next time, much love.